everybody, and welcome to the premiere episode of Gamers Without Borders. Um, this is Test Zero, and with me, of course, is my good friend, the voice of the little boy in the typical Call of Duty Flash animation from Pophead Gaming, Oi! Hello! What animation? See, I don't know what the hell you're even referencing on this. See, you just said that, but what I heard right now was... Why did you do that? I'm gonna tell Ruby on you. What the fuck was that? So, yeah, we're not sure if we're going to make this a full series or what, but we're going to give it a shot because we've been wanting to do a gaming podcast for a while. Mm-hmm. So, our first topic today is with the onset of motion controls, things like the Kinect, the Microsoft the Microsoft Kinect, the Sony PlayStation Move, and, of course, the Wii, do you think gaming is going to move more to a full motion control style or there will still be a place for handheld controllers? Well, mm. I mean, to be honest, I mean, people have been wondering about this for, you know, ages. I mean, ever since the Wii first came out, you know, let's face it, 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 it was, it's always Nintendo that seems to be making these leaps first, nine times out of Yeah, they had the anyway. motion control with the Wii, the DS stylus, and mm-hmm. they were the first to make the analog stick, and yeah. also the rumble pack. So yes. things that are very common in all these in all these things, like rumble features, most... Motion control, all that, are becoming very commonplace with other controllers. Yep. And, you know, I mean, so Nintendo started it off, but it's a question of whether it'll go anywhere, really. Because, I mean, you know, ev- ev- most people these days are waiting for some sort of full century uh, style thing. You know, uh, Star Trek, decks, and everything like that. I mean, that's what people these days want, but it's a question of whether or not that'll ever happen. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that most people want a true virtual reality experience is what they're trying to recreate. But if it's not perfect, then everybody's going to complain about it, which is a lot of things that's happening with the Kinect, because especially something like Sonic Free Riders, which is getting so many terrible reviews for having such bad controls that you can't figure out exactly what you're supposed to do with it, that people don't really know what to think about motion gaming. Personally, I hmm. think there's a lot of stuff to be there's a lot to be said about the actual control to be able to have precise control with the with control pad yeah I'm... yeah uh, gaming is supposed to be an it's supposed to be an immersive experience but it's also supposed to be a form of escapism so if you have if you can only jump as high as you actually can then what's the point of playing a video game well you know i think that's kind of why the we is and probably the PlayStation Move uh, is probably going to end up being a little better than the Microsoft Kinect because Kinect uses a camera and so the controls are restrained, if you will, sort of you know in that sense by human ability and movement. Whereas because the Wii and the Kinect use a controller. Well, the move it's also easy. uses the camera, but that's mostly for it gives it another another degree of accuracy because it's able to tell exactly where the controllers are in 3D space. Yeah, but you know, I mean, with with the Wii, I mean, they it's motion control in that it detects what your hand is doing, but that's all it detects. I mean, it's a case of it just follows where the controller is. With the Kinect, it follows your whole body, which I think is probably the reason why the Kinect isn't doing as well because if you think about it the Wii is kind of held back by this supposed limitation of only knowing where your hand is so you can only do so much with it which then means that you don't try to go all out and make something that's absolutely terrible like on the Kinect if you follow yeah Um, and a lot of people were originally impressed by the Wii and then they discovered that things weren't quite as advertised like Twilight Princess for example you're supposed to be able to control the sword with the Wii Remote, which, yes, technically you do, but it's not a one-to-one control like in a Skyward Sword is going to be. Because mm. they, the Wii was pegged as like this perfect motion control system, but it never really became that until the Motion Plus came out. Yeah. Um, well, you know, a lot of people complained about that. I mean, some companies didn't add that on purpose, like when Red Steel first came out. Of course, the point of that game was it was a combination of um, uh, first-person shooting and um, sword fighting, you know, with uh, Japanese samurai swords. And 
a lot of people complained when they realized that what it was actually going to do is it would you would like slice across and it would slice across and it would register those kind of things but beyond that it wouldn't really register your exact movement and they actually said afterwards that yes we tried that but people found it too hard because you know if you're really going to have to fight someone with a samurai sword you need training to be able to pull that kind of stuff off Exactly, which goes back into the whole concept of escapism. If you can only yeah. do these things as quick as your own reflexes, it's much easier to be able to press a button and be able to dodge to the side rather than having to actually jump to the side yourself and possibly knock over a lamp. Yeah. And so it goes, It in one hand makes it more immersive, but it also makes it less of an escapism. But mm. then there's the other hand of if people really want to go true virtual reality sensory experience that it can truly be immersive and even truly be very, very much of escapism. Yeah. And so if it were a sensory experience that could actually connect to your own nerves and your, your brain impulses, then just thinking about something would do it. Your reflexes would be much quicker. It mm -hmm. can also change the way your body interacts with other things. Yeah. But I think we're still very, very far away from doing anything like that. But... Mm. I think if anybody were to do it, it would be either the gaming industry or the porn industry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with the advent of 3D TV, I'm fairly certain that porn is already on its way up to being something a little more fun. Well, porn is usually on the offset of most, <laughs> of, of most uh, new <laughs> technologies. Yeah, I completely embarrassed you with that one, didn't I? <laughs> you didn't know what to say. <laughs> Sorry, I was referencing a TV show on that one. It doesn't matter, so you can cut that out if you want. Yeah, but, um, um, but if there's a new to technology that porn doesn't choose to use, such as Betamax or HD DVD, then it tends to fall out. I mean, the alternate angle feature on DVDs, most people don't even remember that that exists. I mean, if porn doesn't use it, who would have a who would have a choice to? I mean, who would have a reason to use the alternate angle feature on DVDs? Hmm. I have never seen a DVD that actually uses that. I didn't even know you could do it. Exactly. It <laughs> no, kind of... Nobody so does. The mind boggles what would be the point. I mean, surely when a director makes a film, they choose a specific angle for a specific reason. Yeah. Unless they're a shit director, but... Or if they're doing this specifically for the DVD, but that seems like way too much effort to put in for something that most people won't even realize is there. Hmm. So I, th I think the with the onset of motion controls, it will be a good alternate control scheme. It gets people up, it gets people moving, it gets people more interested in these games because there is sort of a stigmatization towards gamers. It's like they, they just sit there with their controller and they drooling, watching their screen, and nothing's happening. And it's like, but but, but in their minds, they're a they're this uh, fantasy warrior slaying dragons and rescuing princesses and stuff. But in reality, they're just kind of sitting there. But then if you can make this immersive experience with motion controls, then stuff would be all the better for it. What we need mm. is something that's like a truly free-roaming world like Fallout or Oblivion that uses motion controls in such a way. Mm -hmm. But even so, I think there would be a lot of people who would prefer to be able to sit back and relax. That's another thing people like to do. They like to relax when they're playing games. They have they had a long day at work. They don't want to get up and jump around and do stuff. They just want to kind of sit down and have a relaxing game with just their controller. Yeah. So it really is two sets. It's really just kind of two sides of the same coin. Everybody likes gaming, but not everybody likes the controls. Mm, I think mostly it will come down to personal preference. I mean... You know, as you say, not everybody's going to want to be jumping around. So I think there will always be uh, sort of a, a market for the more relaxed gaming. But it's a case of whether... I mean, if the market moves on where motion be controls become an absolute standard, then eventually you're going to see a kind of a split in the market, much like you do these days. You know, you have the more... You have the sort of the big budget titles, which... Uh, you know, uh, for the hardcore gamers, and then you have the casual gamers, you know, people who just like to have a bit of fun, you know, things like, uh, you know, the PopCap games, for example. PopCap I mean, you know, you... old, and then, the, then you have the same split between the, the hardcore AAA titles and then the indie titles, 
which are much cheaper to produce, much smaller games, but can end up making a lot of money. Minecraft mm-hmm. taught us that. The guy managed to make like 600,000 euros. <laughs> and then when he tried to transfer it to his, his account, PayPal flagged it. And, but he made this game pretty much on his own. Uh, it wasn't his first game. He, he had made a couple games before, and he had made a couple of other versions of Minecraft. But due to how popular it became with people, just this one game has, has gotten him a chance to make his own studio, which is really neat. Mm. So, you know, I think, I think it's the case that, you know, as the technology evolves, the market will change as well. And, you know, if, you know, as sort of new technology is discovered, you know, we, we go to whatever comes next after motion control. What would be the we'll, next step, I suppose, would be thought control. I don't know. I think thought control is probably the step after the step after the step. Um, I think, you know, sort of motion control, uh, suppose things more in the way of, um, not so much in how we control it, but it'll be how the game reacts to how we control it. Right, so that, new steps in AI. Yeah. In terms of yeah. AI and scripting. Mm. I mean, you know, if, if, if sort of the motion control through a camera becomes good, it could eventually get to the point where it will have facial recognition. And I mean, you know, I know the technology for that already exists, but it's not really in the gaming market. Yes, I and- mean, you know... But then it also raises the questions, what happens if if you're trying to be nice, but you're not really in the mood to be nice, so the game reads you as being angry, and but you don't want to be angry at the game, you just had a bad day at work, but you don't want to react to it that way, and again, we get back into you know, ha- yeah, yeah. Because well, you know, I mean, we, we, we go around in circles. Want, I, I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. Uh, people don't you necessarily do. want Shut to up. do everything... As they are. It's just like in Fallout, you could either be t- choose to be a nice person or a complete asshole. And some people like to play through both ways. Some people mm-hmm. like to play just like they are in real life, and some people like to play completely different from how they are in real life. They want to go around and kill everybody by punching them in the head on a, on a playthrough, not speaking from personal experience or anything. Um, <laughs> well... As, you know, again, I think that that kind of thing would basically come down to the market. As I said, people who want to be able to have the game read every facet of their body movement and everything are going to be able to buy games that do that. And people who don't are going to be able to buy other kinds of games. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you know people who want to go the full hog are going to have games that are different. I mean, it's fully possible to have, say, if you have a Fallout game where it does read every part of you, and then you have a Fallout game where it's more casual. It's more, you know, you, you could technically have the same game in two different versions. A lot, I mean, you know, or even that kind of a, thing is done. Or it these could days. be the same game with a certain option turned off. Yeah. And because I think that I don't really think a big title like, for example, Fallout would put the effort for it to make so much of an to make an option and make two completely different games with that option. I think it would mm. be. A very hard for most of these big budget companies to do because if you think about it reading your expressions of things is a very very intensive process it requires a lot of processing a well, lot that's of that's why i said it would probably take a while to get there i mean yeah. you know and uh, I, don't, I don't really see a lot of indie developers going into that and i don't see a lot of big budget developers wanting to take the risk of making two separate games with that Thing. So it's going to be, it's going to come down to money. It's going to come down to technology, and it's going to come down to marketing. What and what these people actually want. Yeah, but yeah, I think you know there will always be a, a market for each different type of gamer. You know, the hardcore gamer, the casual gamer, like there is today. I think that's what it's basically going to come down to. It's just the differences, sort of. You know, as the hardcore gaming market gets more and more elaborate, you'll probably see the difference. I mean, it might end up branching off to a completely separate market, you know, that isn't in, in, interconnected in any real way. You just don't know. Uh, well, we're not going to be able to finish this debate anytime, so tell us what you think. Uh, leave a comment on Reviewers Unknown, Absolute Zero, or Pophead Gaming, and tell us what you think of motion controls, what they think they're going to do for the gaming industry. And so let's take a minute now to look into the news source and see what's going on in the world of gaming. Wonderful, weird world of gaming. 
Man jailed for life over murder of Xbox interrupting child. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, this one pretty much speaks for itself, I think. Uh, you know, anybody with well, not even half a brain, anybody with a third of a brain or a quarter of a brain could tell that that guy is obviously... I mean, it, it, people must have something wrong with them to begin with to do something like that, you know? Yeah, which is really the kind of the problem that a lot of people have with violent video games and stuff. They say that people like this become violent because of the video games. No, there is something wrong in their head to begin with. If this... I mean, and this this happened in England, so you can't even say that it's an, an American thing. Did it? No, news to me. Oldham, England, in, in January, women's 15-month-old daughter interrupted him while... With her crying, his reaction was swift, brutal, and ultimately deadly. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I don't think it says what game he was playing, even. <laughs> it happened in peggled. January, so it was probably Modern Warfare 2 or something. Um, maybe. I mean, yeah, I, you know, like I say, these people have something wrong with them. Gaming doesn't make you violent. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I play games all the time, and I'm a bloody pacifist, for crying out loud. And, you know, it's, it's people trying to find excuses. That's all it is. Because either they can't admit that people are fundamentally wrong sometimes, or that it was their fault to begin with. Like, you know, bad parenting. Yeah, it's like you can't say that you try to find a reason for these people to go crazy, but sometimes it's just the, the person is insane to begin with. It's like you there has to be some sort of conspiracy against it. It can't just simply be that they're a bad person. That would be absurd. It's just like, it can't just simply be that somebody flew an airplane into the tower. There had to be some sort of government conspiracy to start a war in Iraq about oil, and they did this and killed everybody on board and then flew it into the tower as a cover-up to that to blame the Taliban. And it's like, no, it's just a bunch of piss-off Arabs. And that's 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 the bottom line. And it's just this guy was an insane fucker who killed a 15-month-old girl because her crying interrupted interrupted his game. If it was anything else, if he had killed a 15-month-old girl when he was trying to cook something, would people have said that cooking makes you violent? <laughs> um, well, they probably would have, actually, because some people will say anything will make you violent. I'm pretty sure some people out there think breathing makes you a violent killer. So, well, um, everybody, yeah. all, all killers do breathe, so yeah. there might be a so, correlation You know, there. there might be something to that, actually. You never know. <sighs> yeah, that was just stupid. Um, <laughs> no, it was. Portal 2 delayed <laughs> until April, so it's a two-month delay from their normal release schedule. Um... That's not really that problematic, let's face it. I think we can all wait for Portal 2. Uh, if it's going to be as good as the last one, I think it's worth waiting for. Although, you have to wonder if the hype for it is so big that it's going to be a letdown no matter what they do. Yeah, I mean, Portal was so great because it was such a sleeper hit. Nobody really under really knew what this game was going to be. They saw from the trailers that it was going to be this neat physics puzzle game, but they didn't realize that it was going to create such a huge following, especially all over the internet, with all the mm. memes and jokes that people make about it. And GLaDOS is quoted constantly on like every gaming forum, and even non-gaming forums. And I don't think Portal 2 could really possibly live up to all of that, especially because Portal 2 is really kind of developing to be kind of a bigger thing than Portal 1, which is understandable. Most sequels are. But I think Portal 1's beauty was in its simplicity. Yeah. You only had the one tool, and you only had the portal gun and the and the cube, really, to do things. There's only maybe three, four, or five gaming elements in the whole game. The, the energy spheres, the cubes, and stuff like that. But then with Portal 2, they're adding all this extra goos and stuff, which I admit the physics for those look really neat, be able to handle liquid physics like that. But I think it's adding a bit too much to a game that should be very simplistic. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I guess it's, it's one of those things which you're going to have to wait and see. I mean, let's, Valve have a good track record. So I think we can all at least give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, at definitely. First. I mean... Um, Half-Life 2 is one of my favorite games that I've played through my 53 Games project, and I will continue to sing the praises of that game. It was spectacular. Yeah. Um, 
But so yeah, Valve definitely deserves the benefit of the doubt in this situation. So let's hope they use that two months to really make sure Portal Two shines. Yep, fingers crossed. Should be good. Also, on live recently <laughs> launched yesterday on Thursday, November eighteenth. The on live service, for those who don't know, is basically a little box that connects to the internet and that handles all of your processing. So all you do is use the controller and the then it goes out to the internet and you get the image back and you're able to play top games without having to have a big computer to play them. And this kind of technology, it's an interesting idea. I'm not surprised nobody has tried it in the past because I'm not sure it'll work even now. Because bandwidth is kind of a critical, very, very critical to this thing working right. Mm. It's Yeah, I mean, it basically comes down to how good is your internet. I mean, you know, that's a question you seriously need to ask yourself before you consider getting something like this. I mean, I sure as hell couldn't get it. I have dropouts all the bloody time. And, I mean, you know, they, they've probably got backups or something on this system ready for when something goes wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I certainly hope they do. Um, and they've, they've been testing this thing, and from what I've heard, it actually works pretty well. But unless you've played it yourself, you really have no way of judging how well this thing is going to work. But if you think your internet is faulty, I'm not sure if it'll work for you. And I, I do believe that this is a very interesting idea, but I'm not sure if the technology is in place to do it yet. Mm, yeah, it's, I mean, it's like when they... You know, as people considered having, uh, uh, you know, online uh, operating systems. You know, it's it's a nice idea, but at the moment it's really not viable. Uh, security issues, as well as anything else, are a problem. And, um, you know, for me anyway, I, you know, I wouldn't like the idea that all my stuff is sitting on some little server somewhere that if someone hacks into, everything could be got at, you know? But, you know, I mean, with gaming, it's not as serious. Okay, you lose a save file, boo bloody who. But There are people that would really freak out about that. I mean, if you put I a... I don't if, mind if you doing lose that. Your mo- is, well, usually you have multiple saves. I mean, if you lose your most recent one, you have one saved back from a couple hours before. Yeah. But if in a lot of these games that only allow you to save once, or you die because you lost connection for some reason... And you yeah. end up walking off a cliff and taking like 600 damage, then you would be pretty pissed off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, personally, I'm rather philosophical about this. I mean, I remember one time I bought a brand new PlayStation memory card, transferred all my Resident Evil data over there, and then the fucker erased itself. And, you know, I, I'd done everything, you know, Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, you know, all the PlayStation Resident Evils fully completed. And it erased itself, and I was pissed off, but I thought, oh, fuck it, it just gives me an excuse to play through the games again. So, you know, I mean, I could be really philosophical about this sort of stuff, but, you know, different people react different ways, I guess. Um, yeah, exactly. There's some people who see it as kind of, oh, no, I've failed, I can't, I lost all my files, I don't want to play through this game again. And that, But then you're forced to ask the question, well, if it's not a fun game, why are you playing it in the first place? Yeah, I mean, the only person who kind of forces yourself to play through a bad game is a reviewer. Or somebody who's playing through all their games in their backlog on some sort of mission. Again, not speaking from yeah. personal experience or anything. <laughs> yeah. Not much. Speaking of which, um, we're going to close by just kind of going over our thoughts on the games we've currently been playing. Um, okay, I'll start with uh, one game that I recently just got into, and I've put about almost 50 hours into it, is... Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess originally came out in 2006, so yeah, I'm about four years behind the curve. But this game is freaking amazing. I mean, I have played pretty much all of the Legend of Zelda games. I haven't played a couple of the handheld ones, like the Minish Cap, uh, Spirit Tracks, but pretty much every Legend of Zelda game, minus the CDI ones, but those don't count. Uh, I've played pretty much all of them, and I've liked them, but Twilight Princess is one is the one that really impressed me at this point. The con- ev- All the levels look so completely different from one another. All the different dungeons, they all have kind of a different theme to them, and they really kind of go with that idea. I- I was, I'm very impressed with that, and I'm very impressed with the story as well. The story seems 
so different from other stuff. The really, but then when I finally got to the Twilight Mirror, the first <laughs> the first shard of the Twilight Mirror, and I talked to the sages, and then they mentioned Ganondorf. My entire desire to play the game kind of plummeted to the pits. Because this game is going perfect, and they had no mention... They had no need to mention Ganondorf. They don't really need him as an antagonist. The game already has an antagonist in Zant. And they really just have Ganondorf in there, it feels, to tie it with the other games. But I thought that's what Link was for. And Zelda to tie it all to the other games. I mean, they've had plenty of games that have not had Ganondorf. Ganondorf didn't even exist until Ocarina of Time. And there's many people who would argue that Link to the Past is an even better game than Ocarina of Time. Mm. And he yeah, was, I mean, Ganondorf wasn't even in that game. Maybe he was mentioned, but he wasn't currently in his first form. I mean, I I just don't even like Ganondorf as a character. He seems so one dimensional. Yeah, it's like, I want to take over the world. Why? Because, because there needs to be a bad guy. Um, That's what Santa's yeah. for, though. I mean, <laughs> they had Zant in there, and they mentioned him from the beginning. And I think Zant is a much more interesting character than Ganondorf, who just wants power. He's a, he's a thief who wants power. Yeah, okay. What does that mean? Nothing. He's just sitting on the sidelines until you get to until you get to him at some later point in the game. Actually, in Twilight Princess, that is pretty much all he does. You don't you, you don't meet him or hear from him at all until the very end of the game. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think in Twilight Princess, it's it's, it's probably his most unnecessary role. I mean, you know, it's I, I I although you know, other than that, though, I think Twilight Princess is really good. I especially when I was playing it, I especially liked the characterization of uh, Midna. Because uh, you yourself talked about that when yeah, you were uh, when when she uh, kind of getting into spoilers here, but it's been 2006. You should have played the game by now. But she um, near the end of the third dungeon, she something very bad happens to her, and you have to save her. And she is she looks in her most pathetic, and I actually felt very sorry for her at that point. I I was and I have not been that attached to a video game character in a very long time. The way that they portrayed her and the music that's playing at the time is really spectacularly done. Yeah. I think it's probably one of Nintendo's best characterizations. I mean, you know, she can she can kick Navi's fairy butt from here to, you know, fucking who fuck knows where. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't no even one like Ganondorf him. as a character in other games. I mean, I don't even... I mean, in Smash Brothers, he's a, he's a clone of Captain Falcon, which... What do those guys have anything to do with each other? I mean, Pikachu and Pichu, yeah, okay. Mario and Dr. Mario, yeah. Link and Young Link, okay. But Ganondorf and Captain Falcon? What the hell? I mean, he has he has this lightning ball attack. He has this sword that he never uses. And he, if, it, it makes me mad that in Brawl he got shafted because they, yeah, they put him in, in melee so that they could use... Captain Falcon's skill set made him a secret character, but I think in Brawl he kind of deserved to have his own skill set. He deserved to actually use his freaking sword. Mm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but it, it's still fun. What have you been it's, playing lately? <laughs> what have I been playing? That's a good question. What have I been playing? Well, um, several games. Um, I suppose the most sort of popular one, uh, Fallout New Vegas. Um... To be honest, I, I remember when I first played Fallout 3, I really wasn't sure I was even going to like it, because I'd played uh, Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion, and I fucking, I cannot stand that game. It is so boring, uh, that honestly, I, I couldn't, the only way I actually found myself to complete the storyline of that game was to um, cheat through it. <laughs> um well, which you know, if if I'm just curious about the story, I, I will do that on occasion. But yeah, um, it's Oblivion really bored the pants off of me, uh, kind of like Mass Effect did. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, Mass Effect. Sorry, yeah, I, didn't I, I tried playing Mass Effect. I got right about to the get part where the game opens up, and that's where I heard you kind of got bored with it. Yeah, that's exactly where I got bored with it because um, it, it gives you so much that you could possibly do. And you have no idea what you want to do, so you end up not doing anything. 
Because yeah. Because you're not making one choice, you're eliminating 19 others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, anyway, I wasn't sure I was even going to like Fallout 3, but I played it, and it was a bit slow to get into, but once I was into it, I realized that I absolutely freaking loved the game. So, of course, I was hotly anticipating New Vegas, and I was actually rather surprised at how much the difficulty had been put up in the game. I mean, a lot of people said that Fallout 3 was easy, but I rather enjoy a relatively easy game. But Fallout New Vegas is quite tough in that if you don't go where it wants you to go during the first few portions of the game, you will literally get your ass raped every single time. Uh, so, you know, you, 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 know you, you, you start here, you sort of start in one place, and New Vegas is like a mile, you know, sort of in geek sort of gameplay terms, away from you to the uh, northeast. But you can't go that way because there's death claws between there. Or these Cazador B things that I really fucking hate. So you have to go down two miles, across three miles, and up to New Vegas in order to get to it. And if you go anywhere off that sort of beaten track in any real way, you will get killed. Well, I'm sure but, there's some people that could do it, but these are well, like insane uh, speedrunners. <laughs> That yeah. just go through there, they spend everything in like defense and speed and just blitz through the the death claws without killing anything. And yeah. get, get to New Vegas and then heal them their ass up. Yeah. I mean it's it's it you know, it's it's very good though. Uh you know, if if you like Fallout Three, you'll like this because it's more of the same. But it it's not like it is Fallout Three because there's a lot of new stuff added to it. There's um the ability to cook your own recipes and stuff like that. You can um, add mods to weapons. You can, and of course, there's hardcore mode, which has already got a lot of press. So I'm not going to go into details about that. Well, have you have you used hardcore mode? How's... I have. I have tried hardcore mode, and um, yeah, it is hard. Because um, I mean, not only do you have to uh, keep an eye on things like you normally do, but you also have to make sure you eat regularly you have to drink regularly because you have a, a h2o meter and a, a um a food meter and you also have to make sure you sleep regularly as well and if you don't you end up suffering from you know sleep deprivation hunger thirst which will eventually kill you and if you die in hardcore mode it's game over um no no that's what that's that's what i always thought hardcore mode meant because that's what it is in diablo 2 if yeah. you're playing on hardcore mode, if you die, it's game over. And yeah. Diablo 2 has no has no save slots. It saves automatically, but if you well, die, it'll delete your you, save. So. You can make um, save slots in New Vegas. So, you know, it it is harder, but it still, you know, has some forgiving qualities about it. So, um, yeah, but it's all good, you know. And, um... Really recommend it. You know, if you're a fan of Fallout, you probably already got it. So, uh, <laughs> not really much point me telling you about it in any real way. Well, if, but, yeah. well, if you played Fallout 3, most people did play Fallout 3 to death, but they don't feel that New Vegas offers enough difference between that and Fallout 3. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it is, I mean, it's, it's built on the same engine, so it's not going to be, like, massively different. But, you know, I was never expecting it to. I wanted more Fallout 3. You know, to be honest, I, I had exhausted completely the Capital Wasteland. I'd, you know, been into every building, looked through everything. And, you know, that's what I wanted. I wanted a new location to explore, because that's what I absolutely love to do in games. I love to just wander off and find something really cool. I mean, that's, that's, that's why I'm such a huge Metroid fan. You know, and I really like Zelda as well, to a point. Um... And, you know, so for me, Fallout New Vegas was exactly what I was looking for. And, of course, some people wanted something completely different. They wanted Fallout 4, which, you know, God only knows what Bethesda is going to do with that, because they said they're not going to make it on the current engine. They're going to try and build a new one. Well, so that's, that's good, because the current engine is kind of buggy, as most people would well, agree. Well, yes. <laughs> but, I mean, considering what there is in the game, uh, you know, I think... Uh, yeah, you, uh, can only, you can only do so much testing, and with... The, this like thousand square mile section. I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating now, but with this thing that everything is so specifically laid out everywhere, like with I mean, if you look at this place and you see like these thousands of like empty beer bottles somewhere, and you just mm. think about it, 
some programmer actually went through and laid every individual one of those bottles out somewhere. And yeah. then they had to do that same thing with every building in the entire area that you're able to explore. You had to design every single rock, although most most rocks use the same model, just rotated or scaled. And you had to design every single rock, every single texture, every single road, every single little tuft of grass that comes up, where it comes up. And you had to design this entire world with this huge team. And then you have a team of QA testers going through and trying to find bugs. It's like trying to find needles in a haystack that's a thousand times bigger than, than yeah. the actual needles that you're looking for. And it's you're going to find some of them, but you're not going to be able to find everything. No. Which I suppose is the great thing about the advantages of patches and stuff these days. So, I mean, yeah, there's bugs. And New Vegas is actually more buggy for some reason than um, Fallout 3 is. It suffers from some really strange um, lags as well from when you've got like more than six characters on screen at the same time, which Fallout 3 didn't have. So I'm not sure what um, Obsidian did to you know, make that happen. Well, I heard that but... there's going to be a new patch that's going to fix most of these errors. Yeah. Because I didn't start playing Fallout 3 until uh, the Game of the Year edition came out. I, I didn't start mm. playing it until last Christmas. Uh, but I, I freaking loved it as well. But well, I, yeah, I, until, I, until your Xbox decided to chew the disc up. Yeah, which really annoyed me. It, it has a, there's a freaking circular scar on it. But it works. I just can't, cr- I just can't talk to Crazy Wolfgang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I talk to Crazy Wolfgang, the game crashes. Yeah, I, I, didn't you get a new version though? No, my friend got a new version because he, oh, right. he he did played it more than my and more than I did. He had a thousand save files. It increased that... every time. He made it up to a thousand. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. I think I got like three hundred, maybe four hundred save files on my computer. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Fallout 3 is a great game, and Fallout New Vegas is also a great game, if you can withstand the bugs. So do make sure that if you buy it, your computer is connected to the internet, so you can download the patch, because it runs through Steam. So um, It's also available on the Xbox 360 and the PS3, of course. Well, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm a PC gamer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would be a yeah. PC gamer if my gaming PC worked. Yeah. Yeah. But speaking of PC games, I have been playing a really neat one that came out a, also came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'm kind of sub semi retro that way. It's a game called Harmony that's built on the original Doom engine. It's essentially a completely new game made with new original weapons, new original monsters, all made by this one guy over the course of about five years. And it's a really good and surprisingly hard first-person shooter, very much in the style of Doom, Duke Nukem, Hexen, all based on those same types of engines. And if you can find out, we're going to have a link under the video for Harmony. And if you can fig, and the game is very is a very nice hard difficulty until you get to the weapons factory, where it becomes fucking impossible. Um. You, they have enemies there that you can empty your entire collection of ammunition into and kill maybe one of them. Wow. All of your ammo for all of your weapons and you kill maybe one of them. And there's like 11 of them in the level. Wow. So I assume you have to kind of run away from them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like overkill. I mean, yeah, and one of the other games you were going on about, um, sort of, you know, indie games and stuff, um, was um, Amnesia The Dark Descent that I've been playing recently. It was a, a few years back when I heard about uh, Penumbra from a friend um, when I was at university, and he said that you should play this game because it's got a really cool, sort of, neat physics engine, and I played the demo at the time, or t- I tried to play the demo, and my computer couldn't run it. So it was a few years later, I upgraded my system and I remembered this Penumbra demo. So I, I downloaded the demo again and my computer could run it. I played on it and I liked it. So I went out and bought Penumbra Overture, the first game of the trilogy, and absolutely loved it. 
because the one thing I love about the Penumbra games, in fact, fictional games just in general, is that they are really, it's really the only games I've ever really played on where I've been truly scared and has actually caused me to panic while playing on it. Um, I mean, even today, you know, after I played the games like a couple of thousand times, I can it can still make me panic if it gets me in the sort of the right place. You know, when I see one of the enemies running towards me, and so of course I played Penumbra, all three of the Penumbra games. And you know, if you if you like horror games in any way, get the Penumbra trilogy. It's 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 dirt cheap now because you know it's been out for a couple of years, so you can buy all three games really really easily. And, of course, their new game is Amnesia the Dark Descent. And it is basically more of the same when it basically comes down to it. You know, it's, you gotta, you hide from your, you hide from your enemies, you can't look at them too long. It's more of the same with physics puzzles and whatnot. But, it's kind of like, not... um, so, it sounds kind of like Eternal Darkness. Yeah. Um, it is, it is quite a bit like Eternal Darkness. Uh, I mean, it, it even has a, a, a sanity meter of sorts. You know, if you look at your enemies too long, it decreases your sanity and stuff like that. Because, you know, it's it's roughly sort of uh, love, Lovecraftian based. Because, I mean, the engine it runs on is actually called the HPL engine <laughs> after HP <laughs> Lovecraft. Lovecraft. Yeah. Because it's, it's what sort of inspired them to do that kind of thing. So, you know, I mean, if, if you're a fan of Eternal Darkness, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, you will probably love that game. It's you know it's 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 only a small group of people who make it and it's not a huge game, but it's it's a decent length. It'll take you a couple of afternoons to get through, assuming you don't just blitz your way through the game. And you know you, you sort of take your time and enjoy the atmosphere because the game's got a lot of atmosphere. Um, you know which um, I don't know. Some games seem to be missing these days. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but um, a lot of games feel like they were just sort of thrown together quickly. Uh, I know it's probably just me. Well, but there yeah. are a lot of games to put out there just in order to cash in on like a movie title, and yeah. those are usually pretty crap. But most indie games, that especially ones that have been develop- in development for multiple years, for example, Cave Story or the Penumbra games, that have, these are usually very good bets for these things. Yeah. So you know, if you like to be scared, or if you don't like to be scared. Um, I really recommend getting Penumbra and Amnesia because uh, fictional games really know what they're doing when it comes to um, to scaring the shit out of you. So, yeah, um, that's all for this episode. We've been going on for about 45 minutes now. So, yes, yeah. please leave a comment below. Uh, yes, comment! Uh, comment! Yes, comment! Please comment on Reviewers Unknown, uh, Absolute Zero, or Pophead Gaming. And... If we get enough response, we might do another one of these. But until then, this is Test Zero. And this is Oi. Bye-bye. Bye.